So good afternoon. Uh, we have now the plenary lecture, The Burden of Records, Ezra Pound's Problematic Legacy, which will be delivered by my colleague, Professor Stephen Wilson, who holds a PhD from the University of Dublin, Trinity College, and is Professor of American Literature, He's also taught many courses in culture, and Anglo-Irish studies, and he is the director of the master's program in poetry and poetics at the University of Coimbra. His recent publications include a chapter on occasional poetry in a book edited by Eric Martini entitled A Companion to Poetic Jamba, published in 2011, and an essay on Moore Vidal, The Inside Man, in the Dublin Review of Books, a very recent issue from 2012, November. Stephen is working <coughs> on a book on Ezra Pound's History Cantos for Blackwell Publishers, and he is a member of the board of the Ezra Pound International Conference. And we owe him special thanks for ha having helped us out when we had a very late cancellation for the plenary session. So thank you, Steve, in the name of all of us. Thank you, Louise. Uh, just a, a small correction. The, the book that's somewhere in the preparation has not yet found a home. It is, in fact, the, um, the collection of essays on poetic genre that is published by Blackboards and what they write about. Um, <clears throat> as Marie Jose says, I've, I've stepped in late in the day to do this. I, I take, I, I hope it works out. Um, <clears throat> some of you may know, should know that the story that says that Humphrey Bogart only got the part of Rick in Casablanca after Ronald Reagan had turned it down. So <laughs> I'm this will work out as well. If Ezra Pound's legacy is taken to signify everything that has come down to us from, through, or because of Ezra Pound, then that legacy is considerable and also something of a mixed bag. Most obviously it comprises of the canon of Pound's own work in verse and prose. This is formidable in every sense of the word. Section A, books and pamphlets of Gallup's bibliography of Pound's work, lists 106 titles published up to 1981. There was still more to come. And section C, contributions to periodicals, <coughs> contains 1,989. At the center of this body of work is the cantos, the long, and when I say long, the most recent New Directions edition runs to 824 pages. Uh, the long attempt at writing a modern epic on which Pound worked for over 50 years and left unfinished. Arguably unreadable and certainly largely unread, it is one of those monsters left over from the age of high modernism. Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, Wyndham Lewis's The Apes of God and Gertrude Stein's The Making of Americans are other examples that we cannot dis domesticate or dismiss. These monumental, or better, mythical uh, texts block or perhaps define our view. In On the Flyleaf of Pound's Cantos, and it's the first poem on your handout now, um, Basil Bunting compares Pound's poem to the Alps with their fatal glaciers, crags, cranks, climb, jumbled boulder and weeds, pasture and boulder, scree, and warms, 
that you will have to go a long way round if you want to avoid them. The alternative is to sit down and wait for them to crumble. A problematic legacy indeed. Legacy is often taken to be synonymous, or almost so, with influence. And it can be said that Pound, as even many of those who are sceptical of the value of his work recognise, was probably the most influential poet of the 20th century. I am thinking here not only of those younger poets, such as Basil Bunting, Louis Sikorsky, and Charles Olson, among others, who may be described as disciples of Pound, but of a larger group of poets whose work has been touched to a greater or lesser extent by Pound. Much of what we recognise as characteristically or typically modern, for instance, free verse or serial construction, uh, serial construction of longer poems, um, the modern idiom in English verse generally, um, by, when I say English verse, I mean verse in English, you know, including American, <coughs> English, Irish, and whatever else there may be, um, was, if not originated, then pioneered by Pound. In addition, there is a smaller group of writers that Pound influenced more personally and directly, whose work he read, amended, reviewed, and reviewed, and whose careers he promoted. On this basis, Robert Frost, James Joyce, H.D., William Carlos Williams, T.S. Eliot, and Ernest Hemingway could all be described as being part of Pound's legacy. That list could be extended. Pound's critical writing, uh, his images and precepts in A Few, few Don'ts, um, 1913, and the 1929 essay, How to Read, later expanded and published in book form as ABC of Reading, 1934, come most immediately to mind, although actually Pound has a great deal of other that distinguished criticism. Um, that criticism has also influenced generations of writers, critics and readers of uh, slightly different circumstances, for instance, I think you could point, a, point out to really a, a quite um, considerable debt that is owed by Northrop Fry, and hence to all those who followed Fry to pound. Um, nor under this heading should Pound's work as a translator be forgotten. T.S. Eliot described Pound as the inventor of Chinese poetry for our time. And it could be added that he brought to, he brought to life Greek, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, Provencal and medieval Italian poetry for generations of modern readers. Pound's politics and economics, and particularly his anti-Semitism and his support for fascism, are also part of his legacy and cannot be forgotten. This, it is usually said, and quite correctly, this is usually um, seen as an entry on the debit side. Uh, however, entailed with this aspect of, of his legacy is a series of often uncomfortable but necessary questions, but necessary and important questions about the political and social uh, role and responsibilities of the poet and about the relationship between poetry and politics, particularly between modernism <coughs> and fascism. These questions should not, indeed cannot, be dodged and what I have to say today will, I hope, be informed by an awareness of them. Although my primary focus is not on literary history or even on a wider uh, historical and cultural context. Rather, my concern is with legacy as a significant element in the poem. And I will argue that the idea of legacy is central um, to, and may be said, in some measure to have determined, to have defined and determined Pound's poem. And 
So it is essential to a reading of the cantons and has significant implications um, beyond that for how we read the modernist enterprise as a whole. Legacy is something, a legacy is something handed down from one generation to the next. Perhaps, perhaps most often from parents to children. Uh, it can be a sum of money, property, or another other specified object passed on usually by will, bequest, or other testamentary act from one individual to another individual or entity. It is a willed and conscious transfer or transmission in which the subject and the object and what is passed between them is specified or are specified, known. Legacy is an instance, a special case, a mode, if you like, of transmission. And transmission and handing on, or handing on, um, and given Pound's definition of an epic is a poem containing history and his assertion that uh, the Cantos is a modern epic, it should be clear that handing on um, is central. Transmission handing on is central to Pound's epic project and to his attempt to write the tale of the tribe, which is one of the descriptions he used to give for the Cantos. <clears throat> Behind the assertion that an epic is a poem containing history lies Pound's view of history as a repository of records and models of good and bad government, fiscal probity, and, high, and cultural high points. For Pound, the purpose of history is instruction, that is to make people think and to guide their thoughts toward what will elucidate today and tomorrow. Not the conventional definition of history, actually, not the conventional old fashioned. Um, Pound's epic histori historiography was, from the outset, present-oriented, present-oriented, didactic, and instrumentalist. That is to say that he intended the cantos to be read as a public didactic poem whose function it was to celebrate and transmit the record of the tribe's achievements, the deeds of its great men, its laws, etc. in such a way that it, the poem itself, becomes an instrument for affecting social, political and cultural change. The poem is public and instrumentalist, both in the sense that it deals with public events, the matters, the matter of the res publica, and in addressing the reader as an actor in the public sphere, a political animal, a citizen. <coughs> Canto 54 quotes approvingly the Chinese maxim that history is a school book for princes. And it seems likely uh, that Pound was aiming at the cantos, if not directly at princes, then at some modern equivalent of the Mandarin class trained in the works of Confucius that ran Imperial China. But I haven't said that, he never missed a chance to send volumes of the cantos to politicians. Uh, he sent them to Mussolini and Tiberius, congressmen and senators, um, all of course to no avail. Um, history is a school book for princes, and that's found, I think, attempted to practice that in what was really quite a literal, literal way. This view of the cantos is scarcely original or new. It is shared in large measure by um, Leon Soret, who uh, wrote a famous book called uh, A Light from a Lucis, a study in the cantos of Ezra Pound, 1979, by Michael Bernstein's Tale of the Tribe, uh, Ezra Pound in the Modern Verse Epic, 1980, 
and by Lawrence Rainey's Ezra Pound and the Monuments of Culture, Text, History, and the Malatesta in 1991. But while what I've said might be widely accepted as an accurate enough account of Pound's intentions, it is rarely taken seriously in, re in readings of the poem. And taking it seriously, um, I should say, is not, of course, the same thing as taking it at face value or at Pound's own estimate. Actually, Philip Furia, who wrote a book called Pound's Cantos Declassified, is a welcome exception to this. Furia has described the cantos as a document about documents and as a reversion to the original function of epic as a tribal archive and has further asserted, and I'm quoting now, in the cantos, the heroes are the archivists, men like Cohn, that's Confucius, Cope, and an army of scholars, editors, and translators who preserve and make new the important documents of the past in palimpsests that mirror the cantos themselves. In these second and third hand documents about documents rather than original texts, um, sorry, it is the second and third hand documents about documents rather than original text that Pound recasts, emphasizing not only the document itself, but the process of documentary transmission. Excuse me, I'm realizing why I'm having some difficulty with this text, it's because I've got the wrong glasses on it. Translation, transmission, and handing down, and handing on, are important in the cantos from the beginning. Uh, this is well illustrated by Pound's version of the episode of Odysseus's descent into Hades in the first canto. Pound does not translate directly from the Odyssey, but from Andreas Divus's Renaissance Latin translation of it. And he renders it in a meter derived from his own translations of, translation of the Anglo-Saxon poem The Seafarer thus overlayering the term is Euchemist, classical antiquity, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance. Uh, the moment of Pound's poet constitutes a fourth layer, the modern world. Canto one begins with and and ends so that, and this gesturing beyond or outside the text itself, which is characteristic of the cantos, also makes apparent the poem's concern with receiving and passing on, with transmission, with, to adopt Pound's dictum, making it new. A legacy, and this is really what I want to focus on, is also part of the overt subject matter of the cantos. Legacy and the problems of legacy. Um, consider the following passage, and this is number two on your handout, um, from Canto 11, the last of the Monopesta Cantos. And one day he was sitting in the Chiexa on a bit of cornice, a bit of stone grooved for a cornice, too narrow to fit his big beam, and hunched up and noting what was done wrong. And an old woman came in and giggled to see him sitting there in the dark. She nearly fell over him, and he thought, old Suliano is finished. And if he's, anything, if he's left anything, we must see the kids get it. And write, write that to Robert, and Varney must give that peasant a decent price for his horses. Say, I will refund. Uh, to understand this, we have to see it in context. The Malatesta Cantos are a multifaceted <coughs> portrait of the Condottieri Sigismundo Pandolfo Malatesta, 1417-1468, who ruled Rimini and rebuilt its church of San, Fran San Francesco. By means of extract from his letters and other documents, given serially rather than sequentially, Pound presents Malatesta as a statesman an enlightened and benevolent patron of the arts, as an ideal prince or ruler, 
and as a lover. In the figural economy of the cantons, uh, Odysseus Polymetus is a recurring type. That means Odysseus, the many-minded. Pound was very struck by um, Homer's description of Odysseus as a man who had seen and done many things, who had many different minds or facets to his personality. Uh, and Malatesta is the first of a series of such characters in the cantos. Um, it should also be noted that the Malatesta cantos mark a decisive point in the development of the cantos as a whole. They are its first sustained attempt to include history, and it is in them that many of the characteristic features of Pound's historical narrative are first encountered. The insertion into the poem of historical documents and fragments of documents, startling juxtapositions, the ellipses and the lesions, and the violent breakings off, um, breakings down that characterize I suppose, part of the practice of quotation. Uh, the Moral Test of Cantos are, I would argue, would argue and have argued, the true beginning of Pound's modern epic. The passage quoted above shows Malatesta towards the end of his life, sitting amid the ruins of the church he has spent much of his life and fortune trying to rebuild. His defeat by the forces of Pope Pius II and his allies in 1463 ruined Sigismundo and effectively ended the rule of the Malatesta dynasty in Rimini after more than 200 years. According to Carol F. Tyrrell's a companion to the cantos of Ezra Pound. This anecdote, which was inserted into the poem at a late stage in the composition, is meant to illustrate Sigismundo's concern for the poor. This may well be so, uh, although I confess to being less than convinced by the idea of Sigismundo as a sort of Italian Renaissance version of Good King Wenceslas. Um, what seems to me to be more significant is that it clearly shows a concern with posterity and handing on. Sigismundo is planning ahead, <coughs> anxious that his work should continue, and <coughs> attempting to put in place an equitable testamentary deposition. Um, and it ends with Malatesta promising to pay at some future date. Say I will refund. The final lines of this same canto, Canto 11, which are also the ending of the Malatesta cantos, I think confirm this reading. And one day he said, Henry, you can have it, on condition, you can have it. For four months, you'll stand any reasonable joke that I play on you, and you can joke back, provided you don't get too ornery. And they put it all down in writing, for a green cloak with silver brocade. Actum in Castro Sigismundo present Roberto de Volturibus Sponte Exercitia to Enrico Aquabel, which just simply says this was transacted in the castle of Sigismundo in the presence of Roberto de Volturibus, the chronicler. <clears throat> like the story of Sigismundo and the old woman quoted above, the story of the wager was added at a later stage, at a late stage of revision. Until that time, the canto closed with the beautiful line, in the gloom, the gold gathers the light against it, which provided <clears throat> a seemingly appropriately elegiac ending to the sequence. This, however, was obviously not what Pound wanted, and he chose instead to end the sequence with Sigismundo striking a bet and promising to settle at a later date, which can, I suppose, be seen as a form of bequest and writing of a check on the future. This is not the portrait of a man on whom the sun has gone down, it's a lie from the Feast of Cantos, but of a man on whom the sun is about to rise. 
The Mount of Testa cantos mark the beginning of the cantos as a poem in Persian history. And so it is appropriate that they should end by passing on a legacy. This, however, is not the whole story. In a compelling analysis of Pound's account of the Battle of Nidastore, this is a battle, the opening battle in Malatesta's war with Pius II. Uh, this account begins at the end of Canto 10 and continues in can Canto 11, so it's immediately leading up to the passages we've been discussing. Lawrence Rainey establishes, I believe beyond reasonable doubt, the Pound was aware of and committed to fascism significantly earlier than is generally admitted, and that his engagement with fascism played a significant role in the composition of the Malatesta sequence. What I would suggest makes it possible uh, for Pound to present Malatesta in this way, that is non-elegiacly, is precisely the rise of fascism in Italy. Sigismundo's hour has come round at last. Uh, this is a thought that I think has profound and disturbing implications, not just for our view of how we read Pound's poem containing history and what is um, but also for what is entailed in its legacy. Um, my second example of the treatment of legacy in the cantons, uh, my second example is Pound's account of the story, or perhaps legend, of Joseph Wadsworth and the Charter Oak, is taken from the other end of the poem, from the Pisan and post-Pisan cantons. Um, if you don't know it, this is one of those probably uh, not true stories of American history that American children used to be brought up on, like George Washington and the Cherry Tree. Yeah. Um, it's the story of how Wadsworth stole the Charter of Connecticut, I've been repeating this, and hid it in an oak tree. And in order to prevent it being confiscated by the, the English. Uh, anyway, the first reference to the Charter Oak occurs in Canto 74, in what Tyrrell re refers to as a long list of bric-a-brac bric and family memorabilia to be found at the New York House of Pound's maternal aunt Francis, uh, Frank, Western. Carved wood from Venice, from Venice, Venetian glass and samovar, and the fire bucket, 1806, Bar, Massachusetts, and the Charter Oak in Connecticut, or to begin with Cologne Cathedral and the tall Wildson Lion and Paolo Uccello, and hence to Alhambra, the Lion Court, and El Mirador de la Reina Lindaraja. That's how you pronounce that. Most of this bric-a-brac appears to be souvenirs from Aunt Frank's European travels. Pound accompanied that on European tours in 1898 and 1902, trips he fondly recalled in the cantos and elsewhere. But mixed in with this are two pieces of Americana, a fire bucket dated 1806 from the town of Bar, Massachusetts, and what I presume is a picture of the Charter Oak, possibly a print or copy of the 1857 portrait, The Charter Oak, by the American artist Charles de Wolf Brownell, 1822 to 1909. Uh, not a work of art that would, in the ordinary course of things, have appealed over much to Ezra. Um, if you haven't heard of Charles de Wolf Brownell, I wouldn't worry about it too much. You're not missing much in the way. Great art, and not artsy. Uh, the reference is to the very possibly apocryphal story of how Captain Joseph Wadsworth, uh, 1647 to 1729, 
stole the Royal Charter of Massachusetts. This was a charter granted to the colonists in 1662, which they believed guaranteed their rights and liberties in relation to the government in the London government. Um, Wordsworth stole it uh, <coughs> and hid it in an oak tree, later afterwards known as the Charter Oak. It was blown down in a gale in, I think, 1856. So, um, in order to prevent it from being handed over to the royal governor, Sir Edmund Andros. Andros was a hate figure for appointed by James II, a hate figure for the American colonists. He appears as, he's the, the villain of um, Hawthorne's story, The Great Champion. Um, so that's the story. The Westerns, the Pound's mother was a Western, were descended from the Wadsworths. And so Joseph Wadsworth was a maternal ancestor of Pound's. This family, this family line also connects Pound to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. According to David Moody, the story as told to Pound by his mother Isabel had Captain, had Captain Wadsworth saving the Connecticut Charter from the perfidious English by dousing the candles with a sweep of his cloak and riding off into the night to hide it in the Charter Oak. Um, the Wadsworths were the, the grandest of Pound's ancestors. Um, as his reference to them and to the Charter Oak story in his prose memoir, Indiscretions, 1923, shows he took a certain snobbish pride in the Wadsworth connection, is what he said. It is one thing to feel that one could write the whole social history of the United States from one's family annals. Hence, Joseph Wadsworth, who stole the Connecticut Charter, and hid it in the Charter Oak to the embarrassment of legitimist tyranny. Um, legitimist tyranny, of course, was the Andros, the English governor of the governor of New England. Um, the evocation of the story of Captain Wadsworth and the Charter Oak in Canto 74 may be, like much else in the Peas and Cantos, on one level, an exercise in nostalgia. But it is also an example of Pound gathering, nurturing, and transmitting a tradition. In part, or in its origins, this may be a family tradition, but it also has larger implications. <coughs> Writing, as he was, from the army prison, the detention training camp, in Pisa in 1945, Pound certainly considered that like his dashing ancestor, he was a victim of legitimist tyranny. The legitimist tyranny, tyranny not of Sir Edmund Andros, but of President Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and his successor, Harry Truman. Pound's appropriation of Captain Wadsworth in the Peas and Cantos is entirely continuous and consistent with his appropriation of Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, and Martin Van Buren in his earlier sequences of American history cantos. He regards himself as the legitimate heir of all of them. Blood kinship uh, was a secondary, but perhaps not an important matter. Um, the other piece of Americana, um, the fire bucket, 1806, Barry, Massachusetts, among Anne Frank's family memorabilia, also has revolutionary associations. Um, Massachusetts was, of course, the cradle of the American Revolution, and the town of Barr was named after Isaac Barre, a cute accent on the final E, uh, 1726 to 1802. Um, Barre was an Irish soldier who served with distinction in the Seven Years' War, or as the Americans called it, the French and Indian Wars, as the American colonists called it. After the war, 
he became a member of parliament and was a staunch supporter of the American cause and an opponent of British government policy in relation to the colonies. I, I take this as a corroboration of my earlier argument. Um, the next reference to Captain Wadsworth is to be found in Canto 97. Uh, and it is angry and overtly political. Uh, this again is on your handout. It's the couplet. Will they get rid of the Rooseveltian dunghill and put Captain Wadsworth back in the school books? Uh, again, a reference to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. You might say that at one level, this requires little in the way of exegesis. The post peace and cantos trace Pound's growing and distressing awareness of the disjunction between the contemporary world and his epic of it. Something that obviously frustrates what I have called his instrumentalist tendencies. In Canto 85, the first of the post peace and cantos, uh, he complained of living in a world in which there were no classics, no American history, no center, no general root. Increasingly, he was inclined to see this as the result of a conspiracy to obstruct the circulation of knowledge, a conspiracy in which the universities played a significant part. These lines are a protest uh, at a particular instance of this, as Pound saw it, politically motivated falsification of history as it is taught in schools. Pound wanted to see popular stories like that restored to the school curriculum. In the final canto of the throne sequence, 109, uh, so it was the last to be written before Pound left St. Elizabeth and returned to, his, to Italy, the last of thrones, uh, he returns to the story of Wadsworth and the Charter and treats it at considerably greater length. This is um, six. Readers. In grateful resentment to Wadsworth, 20 shillings, May 15th, townhouse in Hartford. Charles, God's Grace, 62. Brewer, Cranfield, a body politic and a mere motion, ordained as successors, Wolcott, Talcott, Perpetual, Seal, Governor, Deputy, and 12 assistants, second Thursday, May and October, oaths, ship, transport and carry under their common seal, and not hinder fishing, assaulting by Narragansett and on the south by the sea, mines, minerals, precious stones, quarries, and as of our manor, East Greenwich, in Sockage, not Capite, one fifth of all oars, gold and silver, 23rd April, Westminster, Howard. The opening three lines of this extract are a reference to a public reward of 20 shillings given to Joseph Wadsworth in 1715, presumably for his exploits somewhat earlier. Uh, and this is obviously intended to stand as a rebuke to the present. <coughs> and the remainder is a fragmented and highly condensed transcription of the Connecticut Charter itself. The substance of the Charter need not concern us, but I would like to point out that Pound lists some of the original grantees, Bruin, Canfield, Wolcott, Talcott, and makes it clear that the Charter is also explicitly granted to their heirs and successors perpetually. What Pound is doing here is setting the record straight, an act of rectific rectification. This type of revisionism was part of the epic of his epic historiography histori histori from the beginning. The Malatesta cantos were intended, among other things, to argue that Sigismundo was not the reprobate he was usually presented as being. He is also restoring and passing on an inheritance, acting, one might say, as an executor. Indeed, he is something more than this. At a time when, in his view, the traditional rights and liberties of Americans were under threat, Pound repeats or rehearses the
the deeds of his dashing ancestor by purloining the charter and squirreling it away, not in an oak tree, but in a canto. A canto in thrones. Uh, so, I'm sorry, in a canto. In thrones, Captain Joseph Wadsworth is elevated to the status of one of the minor heroes of Pan's epic. Uh, this is more than an act of family piety. Uh, Pan's history is certainly filiopietistic, tending to venerate ancestors, as is much American historiography. Uh, but by this passing on a part of his own inheritance, Pound made the story of Wadsworth and the Charter Oak <coughs> part of the legacy of all Americans, as he would have seen it, part of the tale of the tribe. There is one further reference to Wadsworth in the poem. 20 shillings to Wadsworth in resentment, townhouse in Hartford. And that comes from the notes for Canto 111. I haven't given up that in your handout. However, uh, that's from drafts and fragments, uh, the final installment, I suppose, of the campus. Uh, although one that probably Pam never really intended to publish. Um, however, in drafts and fragments, there is a significant change in Pam's treatment of legacy. As the cantos drew to a close, or it might be better to say ran down, Pound's relation, his relationship with his audience became increasingly fraught. It had always been problematic. And his capacity to control and organize his material wanes. I have defined legacy in terms of the will and conscious transfer or transmission of a will as a will, sorry, I have defined legacy as a will and cons conscious transfer or transmission in which the subject and object of what is passed between them is specified. This obviously furnishes a model of reading. Drafts and fragments articulates the breakdown of that model. I have brought, and this is the last quote on your handout, I have brought the great ball of crystal. Who can lift it? Can you enter the great acorn of light? Fine, Pound is finally unable to transmit or bequeath anything other than his own inability or to transmit or bequeath anything. I cannot make it flow through, he says in Canto 116. In that canto, 116, the last complete canto, he finally has to contemplate an audience of the young, unprepared young, um, an audience burdened with records. Um, the unprepared young, burdened with records. So he contemplates an audience of the unprepared young, burdened with records, an audience he cannot reach. And I suppose, in a sense, that represents a moment of breakdown, of failure. Uh, was it then the case that, that finally uh, that burden proved too much for both Pound and his readers, that burden of record? If so, where does that leave us? Or well, possibly I should ask, what does that leave us? Do these discourses matter? Uh, well, as I'm inclined to the view that the discourses that matter are those which avoid the word discourse, <laughs> uh, I'll rephrase. Does Anne, does Anne Frank's Rickerbrack matter? Uh, it's perhaps as well to begin by saying that it is not a matter of regret that Pound's epic enterprise, as he conceived it in the early 20s, and developed it in the years before the before World War One, World War Two, miscarried. The cantos, as originally conceived, was, as as I have stated, inextricably bound up with Pound's commitment to Mussolini and fascism. Uh, but I would argue that it survived its author, uh, survived its author and the loss of its putative first audience and that it still demands and deserves our serious attention. 
Modernism was for me the great artistic and literary movement of the 20th century. And fascism, perhaps the only 20th century political, authentically 20th century political movement, was in many ways its monstrous counterpart. This raises questions, as I've said before, uncomfortable questions about the political and social role and responsibilities of the artist and about the relationship between art and politics. Pound's work, as I've also said before, confronts us with those questions in their most intractable but necessary form. This is not just a matter of literary or cultural or intellectual history. Uh, we need to confront these questions. And if we are to confront these questions, then we must read Pound's work, and that work includes the cantos. And so, like Hannibal and his elephants were back in the Alps. Um, there is, I think, a real danger that the cantos will cease, the cantos and poems, like the cantos, will cease to be part of our serious reading. Frank Commode pointed out that this had already happened to Evelyn Spencer. And I think this would be a very bad thing. I, I'm not talking here of changes in literary fashion, or even of the reflection in our sense of the canon, or even of the changes in our sense of the canon that reflect larger social changes. There was a time, and it was not so long ago, that certain stories, those of women, of ethnic and cultural minorities were not told. That has changed, or is changing, and that is as it should be. But one of the disadvantages, perhaps advantages, of growing old is that the role of laudato, laudato temporis acti, a praiser of the way things used to be, becomes more attractive and comfortable. But it is not in this role that I speak to you today. Pound, of course, still has readers, notably the, cla the cra crag climbing fanatics of, Bunting of Bunting's poem, of which I suppose I <coughs> am one. But that, while it may be necessary, is not sufficient. Return to the question Does Anne Frank, does Anne Frank's bric a brac matter? It may do. You will have to decide that. And you cannot do that while it remains inscrutable, unread. The cantos are unread because they are difficult and because they are politically embarrassing. That is perhaps to be expected. They are also unread because they run counter to the prevailing f formalist orthodoxy. In the first instance, this was the, new uh, this was the new criticism with its doctrine of the autonomy of the text more recently radically formulated. Um, <coughs> in the last, for the last couple of weeks, and I'm not doing this, I have been reading proposals submitted um, for the next conference of the Ezra Pound International Conference to be held in Dublin in July of next year. Um, I don't know how many of these proposals I've read, and to accept them, reject them, sort them out into groups. Um, okay. Address now the, the postgraduates in this audience. You know. Oh, boys and girls, if I could only have you get you to understand how one's heart sinks. Um, when you read a proposal that begins, that the proposer proposes to examine in the light of recent work to so Ezra Pound's mu musical criticism, or this theory, or that theory. Um, sometimes this dismay is somewhat tempered when it turns out that this recent theoretical work is stuff that was showing distinct signs of going south when I was a graduate student. Um, 
but the point I think holds. Um, if you can't be bothered to claim, if you can't be bothered to plan the apps, um, and if you can't afford to wait round until they crumble, you can, of course, always deconstruct them. But then, where will we go skiing? <laughs>